Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet. This is Andy Revkin, my sustained wet webcast. This is a pre recorded conversation ahead of the release of a new film that is absolutely extraordinary because it centers on the life of one of the most extraordinary climate focused scientists on the planet. And I say this having interviewed pretty much every climate scientists on the planet, it seems, in 35 years of writing about global warming. Uh, Lonnie Thompson is extraordinary, as the film shows, in both his curiosity, his, his determination, his physical indomitable nature, and his wife, Ellen Mosley Thompson, his partner, lifelong partner in, in this effort as, as well, is just as much a, a part of his science uh, and his advocacy for a sustainable relationship with climate uh, as he is. It's great to have you on here. And it's really fantastic to meet the two filmmakers, Alex Rivest and Danny O'Malley, who have created this documentary, which um, tells the story of your life and struggles and gets across the complexity and challenges that you face, including one of the most amazing moments, your, your health crisis which uh, you'll learn about in a minute. Um, so anyway, you're in Peru, I believe, Lonnie, right? In Cusco? Yeah, yeah, I'm in, I'm in Cusco. Uh, and we're just finishing up our samples. Uh, we'll have that all uh, completed by tomorrow, and then we'll be headed back to the States. And this is at what year of your life? How old are you now? 75. Uh, and uh, this is uh, next year will be my 50th year of studying Kalkaya. Um, uh, and over that period of time, you know, I've been able to watch the changes taking place. And I'm, I'm really astounded. Uh, the changes between 2018 when the film crew was here and what Kalkaya looks like today. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. And in this part of the world, we're here in Cusco. They have a extreme water shortage right now uh, because of the drought in this part of the world. And uh, I know their largest reservoir is the lowest it's ever been since they've uh, uh, kept records on it. So there's uh, the water shortage and of course the glaciers continue to shrink and that really makes issues for the dry season and during times of drought in this part of the world. Amazing. So having lived, having worked on this question in this place for 50 years, you're well positioned to make a, a, an argument for climate change because climate is usually measured as the average conditions over periods of like 30 or 40 years. So you've literally, in your work, lived through climate change and your work is about conserving these records in high ice, from, especially in the tropics that are going away. Um, I'd like to, before we get into the backstories of the filmmakers, which are almost as fascinating as yours, I want to show the trailer from the film. So, and it's called Canary, so hopefully this will work. Hold on a second. In the old days, you took a canary into the mine. If it dies, then it's time for you to flee the mine. My first encounter with Lonnie, it was like I was meeting a real life Indiana Jones. Lonnie was a visionary. He saw that global climate history captured in these glaciers. Lonnie was going where no scientist had gone before. It seemed to be impossible. It's too high for human beings. It's dangerous. There's no way you're going to drill in this remote part of the world. You're wasting your time. Science can only advance when you do things other people think can't be done. He was on a mission to find his place in this world. I had no idea what I was getting into. I had never climbed a mountain. I had no idea what it would take. This was a huge departure from usual. There was something wrong. My doctor said, you have one option and one option only, and that is to have a heart transplant. You just keep going. He was in denial. I remember watching him struggle to breathe, thinking to myself, and you're not going to survive this. 
having gone through these near-death experiences, my message was to help bring together the world. This glacier started disappearing before Lonnie's eyes. He thought he could change something. If he doesn't do it, nobody would. Lonnie didn't come to climate change. Climate change came to him. If humans can create it, humans can solve it. I don't believe there's anything that we cannot achieve. Absolutely remarkable. Well, there's an achievement in this film. I have just watched it ahead of the release. It's going to be in theaters uh, in a number of places. Maybe uh, Alex, uh, let's, I'm going to introduce Danny and Alex and then we'll get, I think um, it looks like Ellen may be ready to come back in too. Ellen Mosley Thompson, the other part of this dynamic duo is here from uh, in near Ohio State, I guess. Uh, you're back home, I, I assume. And in, in, uh, let's see if Ellen's- uh, Hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Oh, good. I'm sitting in my office at Ohio State University. I'm just here working like I work every day. It's been, uh, it's always more difficult when Lonnie's away because then I have to carry his load here, whatever he would be doing here, <laughs> and my load, which is right now teaching a course on global climate change to 26 honor students. It's just great to reconnect with the two of you. And so, as I said, let's talk to the, the filmmakers, uh, Alex and, and Danny, maybe Alex first. Uh, I'm going to show a slide in a minute with the, uh, the information on how people can find the movie. But tell us how this came about. You're, you're, it's not like you've spent decades as sort of climate focused filmmakers. Uh, and Alex, you started out in neuroscience. Uh, how, did, how did you bend the curve toward this arena? Well, th thank you for for having us to chat. This is a, it's an honor, and it's, it's really wonderful to be back uh, on the same screen with Lonnie and Ellen, um, uh, and Danny. Of course, I talk to that guy all the time. Um, but uh, so I I did a PhD in postdoc in neuroscience at MIT. I was studying um, memory systems in mice, but I've always kind of been in someone who liked to explore and go places off off the map and see, you know, what 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 it looked like just beyond the, the, the next ridge. And what I realized when I was doing that is there were always scientists a little bit further than I could ever go. And I, I was kind of pulled in by this notion that I didn't think that was communicated well, that, 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 you know, I'm out here doing, going as far off the map as I can, but there's people who are going further and there, it's just their curiosity and their persistence that's getting them there. So I just had this vague notion that if I could just kind of, tell people, tell kids that their curiosity uh, can bring them to the edges of the planet, that there was something in that. And so I had had this seed stuck in my head. I met Danny over Shabu Shabu in little Tokyo uh, in, in Los Angeles. And I told him, you know, I, I grew up doing science. I've been doing science, but I science programming always feels a little bit like homework to me. And I, I just, it feels like it's missing something. And I told Danny this idea of the scientists that were going beyond where I could go. And he said, well, that's interesting, but what you need is to explain why it's important to them that they're there. So if, if we can ex ex tell audiences and make them feel why it's important that the scientists are in this place at that time, we can do it. You know, at that moment we teamed up and said, we're going to figure this out. Uh, and I, you know, I quit science. Uh, I left the academic track and decided I wanted to change the way the world sees scientists. And we, Danny and I teamed up, we were starting to develop a TV series, which we reached out to Lonnie about. Um, we got a grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to basically prove that scientists are interesting because believe it or not, most people don't think scientists are interesting. And that a lot of that is because the programming is so hands-off uh, what the real motivations are behind scientists. And, um, we met Lonnie on a Skype call, I think in 2017. And within five minutes, he had us pulled into this kind of adventure story. Within 40 minutes, he had Danny and I crying. And when we turned off the Skype, I turned to Danny and I said, if there's a single story we ever tell in this world, it has to be this one. Mm. Um, and Lonnie, you know, a couple of months later said, I'm going back to Kalkaya 
you know, the, the glacier that kind of started his career. And uh, Danny and I said, we're, we're, if, if you allow us, we're going to come with you. And so we arranged to go with Lonnie to film at Calcaya back in 2018. Um, and, you know, we hadn't raised all the funds by the time. The day we were leaving Cusco to go up the mountain, we signed the last contract to, to get us to get us up there. Um, and since then, it's just been a wonderful journey. And I, it's, you know, I, I think this film can help change the way the world sees science and also this issue of climate change, because I think we can talk about that uh, a little bit later. But, um, you know, we set out to change the way scientists are seen on screen. And I'm just so proud of, you know, what this group has accomplished, especially with Lonnie and Ellen's help and, and, and Danny's vision. Fantastic. So Danny, um, if anyone in the sort of TV screen streaming arena knows you, it's probably through things like Chef's Table, which, which is also yeah. about bringing people's lives to intentions and, and the like to screen. But so your brief story of how you got to that table at Shabu Shabu and then this came about uh, some just some brief moments about that. Yeah, I mean, my background is, you know, I went to film school, I worked in post-production, and it was at a time where unscripted stuff was really taking off. So there was a lot of reality TV and a lot of documentary. And I found myself coming up in that world, working with athletes and rock stars and just filming all this stuff. And when I met Alex, um, we had this conversation and I like, essentially I was just like, that's great. People like volcanoes and they're out by volcanoes, but like, I'm not obsessed with volcanoes. And what you need to show me is how someone who was born did not have an obsession with volcanoes. got to that place where they're living by a volcano all the time and obsessed with it. And then I will care about volcanoes as much as they do. Right. And we started working on it together. And this was actually a season, like the summer before we uh, started Chef's Table. Oh, so this journey of trying to elevate science um, stories is a, as long as that show and that show is the longest running show in Netflix history at this point. So wow. um, it's been a long, long road. And one reason um, this movie is really personal to me and Alex is we were told like Lonnie, when he tried to drill Qualkaya, we were told, no, you're not going to get a chef's table camera crew up that mountain, scale down your dreams. Um, like no one's going to want to tell a science story for like a big documentary budget. Um, and we just had it in our minds that like, no, this is an adventure movie. This is like a Spielbergian type life story and it deserves a proper cinematic treatment and we held the line there and just figured out how to make it happen and like Alex said like the day we flew to Peru we didn't even have the money for the expedition um, or for the filming um, but like seven days into the trip just before we headed to the mountain we like secured the funding to pay for it otherwise we would have been on hook on the hook for a film shoot that i certainly couldn't afford um wow. so it's been this adventure where alex and i have been kind of living on the edge pushing the limits of what the film industry will allow what we're capable of and you know it's funny now everyone's saying congratulations you did this amazing thing but every step of it felt like constant failure and learning and pushing through so um <laughs> it's been a really long journey and i think we've made four or five seasons of chef's table during the time that we worked on this film so it's a labor of love like i can't even 
I can't even sum it up. It's just the most important thing in the world to me and Alex. Well, I'm going to swing back to Lonnie in Cusco, Peru. Uh, I've unmuted you, Lonnie. And, you know, there, there's video. The film has video from earlier parts of your life and mountain explorations. It, it's been pulled together in this chronology that's just so remarkable, starting with your, your youth in West Virginia and a, a sixth grade science teacher who was influential which excited my wife who saw the screening with me because she was a sixth grade science teacher for a long time. <laughs> and and you, were, you were in coal country, which is, has some irony, if not just, you know, power to it. So can you just describe a little bit about what it feels like to see uh, that arc of your life uh, now um, envisioned in the film, re recreated in the film? Is there anything you learned about yourself? Well, I, I'm. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think I think uh, yes. So, uh, I I give uh, Alex and Danny credit for uh, linking the story together in, in in a way that it goes on the film. But I also one of the objectives uh, uh, for me was that we somehow we could use this story to inspire other young people who were struggling uh, to find their path and inspire them to you know, uh, be persistent, uh, work hard, find a way to make it happen. Because there will always be people who say that no, you, you can't do that. And, and, and this is, you know, that's an impossible dream, but uh, you have to believe and you really have to believe in yourself and what you, what you can do. So I'm hoping that the film will inspire um, other um, young people who are coming from uh, backgrounds where they may not have all the opportunities that others have. You still can uh, find your way. And so when um, Alex called and I thought, well, okay, here's a way that maybe we can make an impact. And if we don't, I can always tell my daughter, at least we try. I don't think I could have found uh, uh, another team that could tell this story better than Alex and Danny. So so it, it all worked out very well, I think. You're essentially testing another frontier by diving into the communication part. One of the perspectives that I had of seeing the Kalkaya ice cap for almost 50 years is the change and documenting that change. It, it, it's truly amazing in the world. If you talk to the local people, that ice cap is not a physical object. It's a living being that provides water to the Alpaca and for, for their local survival. And so, so to me, the ice cap has a very, very, very strong story to, to tell. And uh, as an observer, as a scientist who's documenting this change, it's it's like uh, a, uh, a a medical doctor who has a terminal cancer patient, and I know why. We know why this ice cap is dying, but I can't do anything. I'm trying, but I can't do anything to stop it. So I'm yeah trying to, and I hope the the film you know, speaks. For the ice, the ice is, is telling us it has no agenda. It is just responding to all the variables in its environment and that it's going to disappear. And um, so I, I think that uh, that story is an extremely important story to tell. Um, there's a really beautiful moment in the film where you were doing similar work in Papua New Guinea. And that ice cap to them was seen as the incarnation of living being and they were concerned about the science extracting something from a very special being and you had a really wonderful conversation with them that resulted in your being able to still work on that ice cap and extract the some of the record of that the memories of that that being can you talk about that a little bit too and then maybe we could get a little more bit from Ellen on, on some of this too. 
yeah, I, I would say that, yeah, in New Guinea, but also here in South America, uh, glaciers are, are, are considered sacred places by the indigenous people. This is where their ancestors go, or this is where their gods live. And so they're, uh, and, it, and it doesn't matter, same, if we work a lot in Tibet. Uh, these, are, these are very special places to indigenous people. So in, um, in New Guinea, uh, uh, you know, we, we always try to go to these places a year before, meet with the communities, talk with them, uh, tell them why we're there, what we're going to do, uh, so they can ask their questions uh, so that they're, we're all on the same page. And, uh, but in, in New Guinea, there were uh, uh, four tribes uh, that live at the base of this mountain, and, and they're still at war with each other. And so it's, um, and the communications are very, very difficult. But nonetheless, when we were drilling, uh, yeah, one day we were attacked by the Among Me tribe, 150 of them. Uh, but they didn't have the crampons, the ability to walk on the ice, and we were drilling up in the clouds, and so they couldn't get up there. Uh, but then they were going to break into the freezers into Bangapura, where we had our ice cores stored. And the uh, mining company, Freeport McMoran, were able to, they had information that this was going to happen. So they moved all the cores to a freezer down on the coast. So when they broke in, there was nothing in there. But then I got this call to come down, but I come down and speak to these people and tell them what we're doing. And I said, I said, sure. And I asked my Indonesian colleagues, I said, let's go down. And they said, no, 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 no. And so we went down and, and they had a, 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 a conference room. And uh, the, I mean, this is the wild, wild west in many ways. And they had guards with guns and, um, so, and they had an interpreter. And so I start to tell the story and I figured the best way to communicate would to show them that in places like Peru, the indigenous people helping us carry the cores and working with us. And so I started this and maybe 20 minutes into this talk, they all stood up, they tore their shirts off and I looked at the guard and he said, oh, they always do that before they go to war. And I said, okay. Uh, uh, but in the, it was actually intriguing because in the discussion, uh, I, I told them that the day would come when their, uh, this ice cap wouldn't be there. And you know they, they accused us, they said, we were here, we were stealing their memories. And I said, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We capture those memories before they disappear. But then this, and then I said, this glacier will disappear. And uh, then there was an argument between the elders and the young people in the tribe. And the elders said, no, the glaciers have always been here. They're part of our history. And then the young people were saying, have you seen what's happening to these glaciers? Have you seen how rapidly they're retreating? So there was this internal discussion and, and then come to find out in their, in their religion, the arms and legs of their God are the mountains and the streams. The head of their God is a glacier. And yes, we were still, we were drilling into their skull of their God to steal the memories. But uh, after explaining exactly what we were doing, they, uh, they did give us permission to finish drilling, take our ice cores and go home. So it, uh, but I, I, I sometimes when I think back to testify before the US Senate, it was almost the same. You had the elders back in 1992 saying, oh, oh no, climate change, you know, it's always changed. There's always a lot of variability in the system, you know. Uh, and then there were younger senators who were saying, now you see these extremes starting to happen. And this was back in 1992. And here we are in 2023, the extremes are much worse. The warming is so, I mean, you know, you, you, can't, you can't listen to the news any day not to see some extreme event on some part of this planet. And 
So the question is, yeah, how do you how do you how do you take that message and actually bring about change that's going to make this world sustainable for all of us going forward? And we we hope this film can get that message out there. Danny and, and Alex, um, do you when you think of the limits of what filming can do, and what you what you have here, you know, what's your ideal vision going forward? Obviously, a lot of people. I mean, see it. I I mean, I can take that as someone who my whole life was changed by movies. Um, and I think the way we like hope it works is everyone who sees this movie asks themselves what they can do. And, um, you know, go make a difference on climate change and the whole population eventually sees it and problem solved. But I think that's not really like there's a diffuse level where that happens with entertainment and awareness grows and people look at their own communities and that's a really exciting possibility. But for me, I think of all the scientists we've talked to, they have a moment where they read national geographic and then they dedicated their lives to that thing that they saw and they went to the museum and something sparks for them that ignites that kind of motor and that passion. The way, you know, Lonnie had a science teacher and next thing you know, he's building a weather station in his family's barn. And to me, the goal of the film is to create a strong emotional connection to the issue, the people who are trying to solve it and the people who are affected by it. So whatever way it can create a powerful spark in someone um, that it helps add to the front of people who are fighting to make a better future because not one film's going to do it. We need a thousand stories like Lonnie's and we just hope that this is one that starts to give people that strong connection and make them realize, oh, this affects me too. And, you know, I have conservative members in my fam family who saw the movie, didn't really think much about climate change before. And when they saw the scene with uh, the community that lived near the glacier and how they're affected, um, these are people so far away from my family, but their response to that scene was that was the first time I thought this might affect me. So it's really about showing people that, you know, it's not about just sea level rise and these abstract things. It's about people and our ability to protect our children and our children's children in the future. And there's only one side of this issue and it's fighting to make a better future. And that's the way I see it. And I think this film really kind of, one thing in it is like previous films of, do you believe in climate change? Do you not? here's the facts, let's try and get you on board. And this film kind of says facts are not what's going to do it. You need to tell the human stories. Science has done its job. And like, it's up to the rest of us to be like Lonnie and say, we don't know unless we try. We need to go build a better future. There's no perfect answer. There's a thousands of ones that'll build up and create that future. And the only way to solve the problems with those solutions is to pursue them. And we're all at the beginning of Lonnie's story, heading to, to Kwakaya for the first time. And we don't know what's in store, but we have a dream. And that dream is a better future for all of us. Um, I want to bring in Ellen to talk about a couple other aspects of this. Thinking about the... Um 
dimensions of society, you know, even in your part of Ohio, where I now live in Maine, total red blue mix. Um, but I can find all around me deep enthusiasm for switching to heat pumps. We put on a heat pump, we just moved here a year and a half ago. We have a heat pump, it's cutting our energy bills. My mother in law, who's 91, lives, lives in a tiny lobster village, she's putting in a heat pump. And her, her, her family is very conservative, a big chunk of it. So how, how do you think about this, uh, Ellen, in, uh, uh, you know, the, the, not just the film, but your, your work as a team with Lonnie and, and through these decades and where we are now compared to where you were? Well, it's been a long journey, let's put it that way. And we've come, I think that um, often change is happening and you're so close to it that you don't see it changing unless you step back and think about it. But I remember 30 years ago when we were concerned about, already concerned about global climate change and what we were seeing, not just in the ice and the glaciers in the mountains, but the Antarctic and the Greenland ice sheets, starting to see changes there. And um, Lonnie and I would be asked to go out to give a talk and then at the, at the end, we'd have a Q&A. The, the questions were pretty rudimentary. And, and I'm not saying that in a derogatory way, but the general public just really had not become fully cognizant of climate change and all that it involves. And so we did enter, we did um, experience, um, what do I want to say, some anger and some hostility. Um, I remember Lonnie and I had to speak before, just real quickly, we had to speak before a, a school board because there was a, 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 what I call a climate denier, a very prominent climate denier here in our region, who was trying to uh, get space in the school to have a course to, to, to teach the, the students the real science of climate change which was not the science at all, it was his science. And so Lonnie and I went before the, the Board of Education there in that school district and showed them the facts and talked about you know, climate change really from a scientific perspective. And when it was over, when I, we were leaving, I was attacked by a person. And fortunately there was an, a big man close by and it wasn't Lonnie who took the guy and kind of got him off me. But it was a, a real eye opener that those facts, the data that we show, that's not gonna be enough. And we have to figure out how we can effectively communicate with um, the people, with the other people who are not scientists. And that's not easy to do for a scientist, but uh, we've spent a lot of time trying to think of like analogies and things like that, that we can use when we're, when we're talking and most importantly, learning to not talk down. And part of, part of it also is just to become part of their world and talk about our experiences, but more of in the context of what we know those people have experienced. We have agriculture's really big here in Ohio and early on, the farmers here absolutely denied that there was any climate change. But then you start asking them about, well, you know, what, what, what little animals do you see around the pond? Are they the same that your grandfather would have seen? What are you experiencing? And just kind of getting down to the level of just our common interests in our food, our water, the quality thereof, the abundance, et cetera. And it's amazing how that just opens doors and they want to talk with you and share coffee. And then because Lonnie and I are from West Virginia in the Southern part of Ohio, we can slip right in to that society essentially and be fully accepted. And once people realize that you're not trying to change them, but you want to work with them for changes that 
we collectively want to make, it's amazing how much progress you can make. That's fantastic. I was really interested. The movie has a clip from the moment that Lonnie got the National Medal of Science from George W. Bush. You know, I was writing extensively for the New York Times through that whole stretch. I noted in the video you showed, there's a fleeting image of Anthony Fauci, who uh, you both, you received the award in 2007, although you got them in 2005, I believe. Um, and that says something about what Ellen was talking about, that you know, Fauci has say, faced the same acrimony that Ellen described there, uh, still does. Um, and I think that Ellen and described the pathway forward, which is through listening, a lot of active listening, through uh, using a film like this as a beginning point, for example, for conversation, not as something to necessarily to drive conversation. And Lonnie, this came to mind when you were negotiating with the Papua New Guinea tribes people, because there was a lot of listening there. And I recently did a webcast here um, on a project in the Arctic where uh, climate scientists were working for five years with indigenous people in, uh, in Kotzebue, Alaska to design a research project. Now the scientists weren't just parachuting in and doing their research and maybe holding a town meeting. They were working with elders, the, the scientists of that village of Kotzebue, the Inupiat scientists to design their inquiry right from the start. And I think the more of that, the better. Lonnie, I'm going to unmute you briefly to see if you can add some thoughts about the importance of conversation. And then we're going to get back to the movie. Yeah, I, I think the uh, being able to communicate with people on their level and their, because ultimately facts will not change people's opinion. That change has to come from within. And you, so you have to find the common ground where you do things that you do agree on and then build from, from there to really have communication take place. Uh, one of the things I would say about uh, the time we live in that concerns me is uh, truth. Uh, what is truth? And, you know, truth in science, uh, the facts, you know, that's what protects us. You know, if you uh, if uh, you you look at a glacier, to me, it's it is uh, just nature telling us a truth. It's summing up the radiation, the temperature, the precipitation, all the things that allows it to exist, and it responds to those. It it cannot be. Uh, it has no political agenda. Uh, it cannot be bought out. It will respond to what's going on in its environment. So it, to me, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a pure truth of what's going on uh, in, in, the, in our environment. And the fact that they're retreating all through here in the Andes, but through the Himalayas and Tibet and around the world is a very strong message to all of us who live here that our environment in which humans and civilizations have developed, it's changing and it's changing very rapidly. That's right. And let's show, here's another clip from the film. February 18th, looking at this glacier in the crater, you can see that it's wasting very rapidly. It's hard to see how it could last more than 10 years into the future. And out here, there's a strange one all by himself. It's like an iceberg without an ocean. After Waskaran, we started to really get concerned about how rapidly the change was coming. Most glaciers were losing mass when you realize they're going to disappear. Well, again, this is just a short clip from this extraordinary film, Canary, and it shows you exactly what Lonnie was just talking about. When you look at it across the landscape of the whole planet, uh, then 
the um, arguments, <laughs> the counter arguments kind of fade away completely. And I remember uh, you mentioned in passing, these are these glaciers all around the um, around the tropics, particularly are the, the uh, kind of the true canaries because they're so far ahead of things. In 2001, my first, uh, I think I had already quoted you in something I had written earlier. Uh, I've been writing about global warming since 1988, but the page one story in the New York Times in 2001 from Kilimanjaro caught a lot of people's attention. And this was before social media and before people were retweeting stuff. And yet it's still, but that was in that era, that was the early stages of that era where Senator Inhofe and others would use, quickly yell the counter, you know, these kind of counter arguments that weren't really based in, in science. And we've come a long way since then, particularly because of your science. I still can't believe that you had a heart transplant, which was the subject of my journalism master's degree, master's thesis in 1982. My, my Columbia master's thesis was on future of organ transplantation. And I, I got to witness in the operating theater, a heart transplant. And the idea that you had one and have returned to your mountain environment. I can't remember if it was Ellen or your daughter who was talking about, there's some aspects of your obsession that are really remarkable to behold in the film, but you're still going at it, even at your day, day and age when others might be uh, in their emeritus, you know, lounging period. So again, I'm really glad the film captured that entire pathway. And I don't know whether there's something to say about the value of just perspicacity and I mean, what people have to think about. I, I have something that like to the topic of kind of all the things you just circled around and Lonnie was talking about is like, there's no other person like Lonnie. There's coral scientists, there's, people in Greenland or people in Antarctica that see these impacts. But I think one reason that Lonnie's story is so powerful is not only there's no arguing with a melting glacier, but he along his narrative has witnessed that impact on like a global scale. So if we're talking about global warming and the facts don't penetrate you need a human being who's witnessed it all over the planet to get that personal connection to something of that scale and Lonnie's ambition and his never quitting and always finding the next glacier to get data that like hunger he has put him in a position where this once in a history event of global warming that is so large and so hard to put in a human scale, like that ambition matched the scale of the moment in a way that makes this film like a must see because you just tell Lonnie's story and you see images throughout the whole thing of this stuff adding up. Um, you know it's backed by the science, you know who this guy is and half the movie isn't even about global warming. It's just about his young science adventures at first. And so you see him as this underdog. And then next thing you know, he's bringing you video and like evidence of this happening all over the globe. And it makes you uh, let down your guard and also just provides you with a bunch of stuff that's really hard to argue with. And we're not even arguing it. We're just leaving it there. Um, and if you have co cognitive dissonance, it's pretty relentless because Lonnie's whole back half of his career has been facing that uncomfortable truth. That's so interesting. So nicely put, you know, you also, the film gets at something that's important, I think for those looking at their career paths for young people, uh, Lonnie, I've got you back here. One is serendipity. Yeah. You know, Lonnie, as you say in the film, yeah. let me just, I, I'm going to mute you for a second. Hold on. Um, in the film, you say, you know, you never climbed a mountain and, and you really didn't 
it, it was basically like it feels like you didn't want to climb mountains, but you knew that that's where the evidence lay. Uh, other scientists you met, uh, a job you got that was just one of a variety of jobs you might have gotten as a young scientist pulled you in that direction. Can you talk about serendipity? And I know, by the way, everybody, uh, if you've got to end this shortly, uh, uh, we can. If not, we can go a little longer. But so let's talk about serendipity. And and because a lot of young people, I think, right now are very worried. They have to be on a track. They have to follow a very strict path to get to where they need to go. And what do you think about that, Lonnie, the serendipity part? Well, you know, I think we, when we start out in, in, in our educational path, and certainly when I went to Ohio State from West Virginia, I went there to study cold geology because I was looking to get an education to get a job. And it was only because I had an opportunity to uh, take a research position in what was then the Institute of Polar Studies. And that the idea at that time that I could even make a thing looking at ice so covered ten percent of the planet. It was, you know, how are you going to do that? It's a research position, which meant I could get my degree faster, and I could get out and get a job. So I took it. But once I took a trip to Antarctica and I saw how much ice there really is on this planet, then I started to think. Well, maybe, maybe there's a thing here. And, and I think that, uh, yeah, for young people, I think it's, it's uh, there's a lot of serendipity in life. You shouldn't make up your mind where you want to go until you have had an opportunity to be exposed to all the variables that are out there. And, uh, you know, I think they're, they're, they're all kind of uh, opportunities. And, and certainly when I, I look back on Kalkaya, I mean, they, uh, there were no agencies, there was no funding agencies to fund anything if it wasn't in Antarctica or Greenland. And uh, our first mission there, yeah, $7,000 left over in the pull program's budget. Uh, you know, they all the real science. And I mean, you know, what could you do with $7,000 on that tropical glacier? And you know, yeah, I could get there, and so we did, and so it, uh, and and then there was no way. I mean, when you, I mean, certainly the ice cap itself was just amazing to find such an ice cap right above the Amazon basin in the tropics. I mean, you, know, you just don't; they don't go together, and and yet at uh, you know nineteen thousand feet, uh, two day journey from the end of the nearest road. How in the world are you going to drill it? How are you going to get a, a drill up there? How are you going to get the ice cores out? So there was a lot of um, uh, yeah, trying to figure out how how you could do it. And, you know, uh, and 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 I must say that without uh, really great teams of people that I've had to work with over the years, it couldn't be done. And I've been very fortunate to have such dedicated uh, field team members who, you know, they see the importance of what we're trying to do and, and, and they buy into that and they make it happen. And so uh, it takes a, it takes a team and our projects are international to uh, have any chance of solving climate warming and, 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 getting a handle on our greenhouse emissions, we have to be able to work across borders and be able to communicate with people who don't think like we do. And one of the beauties of our programs, uh, for example, working in the Western Coolings in far Western China, we had 60 people on that expedition. And those people came from Russia, they came from China, they came from the US, they came from South America, they were Tibetans. And yes, we don't all think alike. We don't all believe in the same things, but we still can focus on an objective, work together and accomplish that objective. 
And that's what's going to have to happen when we uh, when we deal with climate change. It's yeah, we, we have to get above. We have to realize this is a problem we all face and we can only solve it by working together. And so uh, that's one of the things that uh, is very clear to me and having worked in so many 16 different countries and worked with indigenous people, there are far more good people trying to do the right thing out there. And we just need to give them a voice and I think we can change our future. I can't think of a better spot to to stop our conversation here and perhaps we can reconvene. Uh, Lonnie, maybe when you're back from Peru or at some point, uh, like there's so many more threads here to explore. But what I'd love to do is have people see the movie uh, which is premiering yes. in theaters around the country. Uh, so right now we have a, a theatrical run. And so September 20th of this year, 2023, it'll be in 140 screens across the country, which when we first started figuring this out, we were told 25 screens would be a, a, you know, a dream for a documentary film. And we were just so excited for that. And, you know, as of last week, it was 70 screens. As of today, it's 140 screens on September 20th. And that's a one time night, you know, uh, on September 20th. Um, if sales go well, it'll continue to open up in, in theaters. And then in Los Angeles, uh, New York and Columbus, where, where Ellen is right now, um, it'll be played for an entire week. Um, and because we, there's, there's enough, um, you know, conceived demand and, 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 and energy around this, um, around this film. So, uh, September 20th is the day. And on the, on the site that you're saying now, canary.oscilloscope.net is where you can find the screen nearest you beyond that. We will see, uh, it'll, it, at some point it'll be available online. Um, and then in other continents, other countries, this film was filmed to be shown on the big screen. So if you have the opportunity to do it, uh, some of the cinematography from our uh, DP, Devin Whetstone, is absolutely spectacular. And when you see it on the big screen, it can, gives you the little chills in the, the back of your neck. Um, so yeah, um, we're excited. We'll, we'll be at a bunch of the screenings doing Q and A's. I know Lonnie and Ellen will be doing a bunch as well. And we're just excited to share this film. I mean, I think Lonnie and Ellen have pushed the frontiers of science uh, and our understanding of this planet. And I think with this collaboration, uh, are pushing the frontiers of how science communication can happen. And, you know, by opening up and being so uh, available to tell us their story and their emotions and what happened and struggles, this is something that we need more of. And I'm just, I'm so humbled to have, gotten to know them so well and just excited to share this movie with the with everyone well i'm excited to have had this conversation with all of you alani you're muted hold on a second lani you're now unmuted i think you were going to say one last thing i i, I have to say there's a tremendous interest in this film here in peru so we uh, have to have some screenings down here so uh, for the for the locals because uh, you know this is a. Uh, 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 very important for them, and and as a result of the research we've done here, the the government has made Calcaya a a climate hiking place and a geopark, and they're trying to preserve it because they're also around this ice cap uranium and lithium deposits, and those mineral rights belong to a company in in Canada. And so there's uh, the local indigenous people who want to keep this environment that they have and keep it pristine like it is. And yet there's these outside interests uh, in this area. And so we're actually playing a, a role here in trying to preserve this to keep it in its natural form as, as we found it almost 50 years ago. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you, Lonnie Thompson. Thank you, Ellen Mosley Thompson. It's been a privilege to have reported on aspects of your journey myself through the three, four decades I've been on this beat. And it's just super exciting to see how beautifully this film has captured that journey and could very well elicit uh, a new generations of folks to push the limits 
um, whether they're pursuing energy innovation, regulatory innovation, or more science showing us the state of our changing planet. Uh, this is Andy Revkin, uh, my Sustain What webcast. Uh, find this film and, and lobby, make sure to generate the buzz that will help to push it uh, from these screens to more screens, uh, large and small. Uh, thanks all, all of you for being here.